Chapter 13, The Second Bomb. No one was in the kitchen of Shin Hu's restaurant when the bomber set a tall can labeled monosodium glutamate behind similar cans on a shelf. The color-striped candle would burn down to the fuse at 6.30. Whoever was working there would be at the other end of the room. No one would be hurt. Due to the unfortunate damage to the coffee shop, Shin Hu's restaurant is prepared to satisfy all dinner accommodations. Order down or right up to the fifth floor. Treat your taste buds to a scrumptious meal while feasting your eyes on the stunning snowscape before it melts away. Reasonable prices, too. Grace Wexler tacked her sign to the elevator wall as she rode up to her new job. She was going to be the seating hostess. Where's the cook? Mr. Hu shouted, meaning his wife. He found Madame Hu in their rear fourth floor apartment, kneeling before her bamboo trunk, fingering mementos from her childhood in China. She hurried up to the kitchen, too harried to find the words that would explain what was happening. Now, where was that lazy son of his? Doug jogged in from a tiring workout on the stairs. How was he supposed to know the restaurant would open early? Nobody bothered telling him. Some student you are. Anyone with the brain of an anteater could have figured that out. People are short of food. The coffee shop is closed for repairs. Stop arguing. Go take a shower and put on your busboy outfit. Get moving. Don't you think you're rather hard on the boy? Grace commented. Somebody's got to give him a shove. If he had his way, he'd do nothing but run. Who replied between bites of chocolate. You're not so easy on Angela either. Angela? Angela was born good, the perfect child. As for the other one, well, it's not easy being a parent, who said woefully. You can say that again. Grace held her breath. Her husband would have done just that, said it again. But Mr. Who only nodded and shared sympathy. What a gentleman. Only Mr. and Mrs. Theodorakis ordered down. The other tenants of Sunset Towers lined up at the reservations desk, waiting for Grace Windsor Wexler to lead the way. Oversized menus clutched in her arms. Grace felt the first proud stirrings of power rush up from her pedicured toes to the very top curl on her head. If Uncle Sam could pair off people, so could she. You see your brother every day, Chris. How about eating with someone else for a change? She wheeled the boy to a window table without waiting for an answer. It would have been yes. The two cripples together, Sidel Pulaski thought. She'd show that high and mighty hostess. She'd show them all. She and Chris could have private jokes too, and everybody would be sorry they weren't sitting with them. What's Moogoopin? Chris asked, baffled by the strange words on the menu. I think it's boiled grasshopper, Sidel screwed up her face and Chris laughed, or chocolate-covered mousse. French fry mousse, Chris offered. Now Sidel laughed. They both laughed heartily, but no one envied them. Your brother seems to be enjoying Miss Pulaski. Theo nodded, awed by the beautiful Angela. Three years older than he, so fair-skinned and blonde, so unattainable. Here he was, sitting at the very same table with her, just the two of them, and he couldn't think of a single thing to say that wasn't stupid or childish or childishly stupid. Usually the quiet one, Angela tried again. Are you planning on going to college next year? Theo nodded, then shook his head. Say something, idiot. I got a scholarship to Madison, but I'm not going. I'm going to work instead. What big worried sky blue eyes the operation for chris will be very expensive that was worse now she's feeling sorry for him if chris had been born that way maybe it wouldn't be so bad but he was perfectly normal a great kid and he's smart too about four years ago he started to get clumsy just little things at first perhaps my fiance can help angela bit her lip theo was not asking for charity Fiance, what an old-fashioned, silly word. I went to college for a year. I wanted to be a doctor, but, well, we don't have as much money as my mother pretends. 
dad said he could manage if that's what I really wanted, but my mother said it was too difficult for women to get into medical school. Why was she gabbling like this? I want to be a writer, Theo said. That really sounded like kid stuff. Would you go back to college if you won the inheritance? Angela looked down. It was a question she did not want to answer, or could not answer. Long before becoming a judge, Josie Jo Ford had decided to stop smiling. Smiling without good reason was demeaning. A serious face put the smiler on the defensive. A rare smile put the nervous witness at ease. She now bestowed one of her rare smiles on the dressmaker. I'm so glad we have this chance to become acquainted, Mrs. Bombach. I had so little time to chat with my guests last night. It was a wonderful party. Flora Bombach appeared even smaller and rounder than she was as she sat twisting her napkin with her hands accustomed to being busy. Was her face permanently creased from years of pleasing customers, or was a tragedy lurking behind that grin? Have you always specialized in wedding gowns? Mr. Bombach and I had a shop for many years. Bombach's for the bride and groom. Perhaps you'd heard of it. I'm afraid not. The judge would would have said no in any case to keep her witness talking. Perhaps you've heard of Flora's bridal gowns? That's what I called my shop after my husband left. I don't know much about groom's clothes. They're mostly rentals anyway. Flora Bombach lost her timidity. The judge led her chat away. I'm using heirloom lace on the bodice of Angela's gown. It's been in my family for three generations. I wore it at my wedding, and I dreamed that someday I'd have a daughter who would wear it. But Rosalie didn't come along until I was in my 40s, and the dressmaker stopped. Her lips tightened into an even wider grin. Angela will make such a beautiful bride. Funny how she reminds me of her. Angela reminds you of your daughter? The judge asked. Oh my, no. Angela reminds me of another young girl I made a wedding dress for. Violet Westing. The heavy charms on Seidel Pulaski's bracelet clinked and clunked as she raised a fork and flourished it in a practice ritual before aiming it at her open mouth. Chris's movements were even jerkier. She's a good person, he thought, but she thinks too much about herself. Maybe she never had anybody to love. Here, let me help you to some of this delicious sweet and sour ostrich. Their laughter drowned out the loud groan from another table where Turtle sat alone. The transistor radio plugged in her ear. The stock market had dropped another 12 points. I'm starved. Let's sit down to eat. Had held high, Grace Wexler led her husband across the restaurant. All I want is a corned beef sandwich, not a guided tour. Would you prefer to sit alone or with that young lady over there? I thought I was going to sit with you. Please be seated, Grace replied. Jimmy, I mean, Mr. Who, will take your order shortly. Jake snatched the menu from his wife and watched her glide gracefully, he had to admit, to the reservations desk and whisper in Mr. Who's ear, Jimmy, she calls him. That's a fine kettle of fish, he exclaimed, then turned to his dinner companion. Fine kettle of fish. I'm so hungry that even that sounds good, and from the looks of this menu, that's probably what I'll get. I'm okay, Sutter replied the final prices of actively traded stocks tumbling in her ear. Mr. Who waddled over. I recommend the striped bass. See, what did I tell you? A kettle of fish. Turtle switched off the radio. She had heard enough bad news for one day. How about spare ribs done to a crisp? Who suggested. Then he lowered his voice. What's the point spread on the Packers game? See me later, Jake muttered. Go ahead and tell him, Daddy, Turtle said. I know you're a bookie. Can you stand on your legs? Seidel Pulaski asked. Can you walk at all? People never asked Chris those questions. They whispered them to his parents behind his back. N no, why? What better disguise for a thief or a murderer than a wheelchair? A perfect alibi. Chris enjoyed being taken for the criminal type. Now they really were friends. When you reminos. What? Oh, read you my notes. Soon, very soon. 
Seidel daintily touched the corners of her mouth with the napkin, pushed back her chair, and grabbed the polka dot crutch. That was a superb meal. I must give my compliments to the chef. She rose, knocking the chair to the floor, and clumped toward the kitchen door. Where's she going? Angela, starting up to help her partner, was distracted by shouting in the corridor. Hello in there! Anybody home? Through the restaurant door came a bundled and booted figure. He danced an elephantine jig, stomping snow on the carpet, flung a long woolen scarf from his neck, and yelled, Otis Amber is here! The roads are clear! That was when the bomb went off. Nobody move! Everybody stay where you are! Mr. Who shouted as he rushed into the sizzling, crackling kitchen. Just a little mishap, Grace Wexler explained, taking her command post in the middle of the restaurant. Nothing to worry about. Eat up before your food gets cold. A cluster of red sparks hissed through the swinging kitchen door, kissed the ceiling, and rained a shimmering shower down and around the petrified hostess. Fireflies of color faded into her honey blonde hair and scattered into ash at her feet. Nothing to worry about, she repeated hoarsely. Just celebrating the Chinese New Year! Otis Amber shouted, adding one of his hee-hee-hee cackles. Mr. Who leaned through the kitchen doorway, his shiny straight black hair, even shinier and straighter, plastered to his forehead, water dribbling down his moon-shaped face. Call an ambulance! There's been a slight accident! Angela dashed past Mr. Who and into the kitchen. Jake Wexler made the emergency telephone call and sent Theo to the lobby to direct the ambulance attendant. Why are you standing there like a statue? Who shouted at, his son, shouted at his son. You told everybody to stay where they were, Doug said. You're not everybody. Madam Who tried to make the injured woman as comfortable as possible on the debris strewn floor. Angela found the sequin spectacles, wiped off the wet, crystalline mess, and placed them on her partner's nose. Don't look so worried, Angela. I'm all right. Seidel was in pain, but she wanted attention on her own terms, not as a hapless, foolish victim of fate. Looks like a fracture, an ambulance attendant said. Feeling her right, said feeling her right ankle. Careful how you lift her. The secretary suppressed a grunt. It was bad enough being drenched by the overhead sprinkler and draped with noodles. Now they were carrying her right past them all. Grace pulled Angela away from the stretcher. You can visit your friend in a few days. Angela, Angela, Seidel moaned. Pride or not, she wanted her partner at her side. Angela stood between her determined mother and her distraught partner, paralyzed by the burden of choice. Go with your friend, Angie Pye, Dick Wexler said. Other voices chimed in. Go with Pulaski. Grace realized she had lost. Perhaps you should go to the hospital, Angela. It's been so long since you've seen your Dr. D. She winked mischievously but only Flora Bombach smiled back.